Hey guys, welcome back. A few weeks ago was E3, and while most people were excited about the major reveals at the Gaming Expo, that wasn't the only focus for the Halo community. For better or worse, 343 chose to release the next Halo novel, Halo Hunters in the Dark, that same week. The book is written by Peter David, also known in the Halo community for his work on Halo Helljumpers. Set in 2555, the book takes us back to the forge of the Halo Array, the Ark, bringing back some established characters, and gives us some backstory on a new character that will take a prominent role in Halo 5 Guardians. From here on out, it's spoiler territory. If you want to skip to my spoiler-free wrap-up, click the annotation on the screen, or pause and click the link in the description box. For everyone else, this is Halo Hunters in the Dark. Our story begins sometime in 2554, focusing on the last surviving member of Broadside, one of several remote contact teams, or RCTs, that were deployed to the surface of the Ark following an unknown signal that had been detected the year before. Only one RTC made it back to the ship, the ONSC Rubicon. Broadside 1 tries to make contact, relaying that his team had been attacked by unknown creatures, but he is informed by a mysterious voice that the UNSC Rubicon was gone. It informs him that he is the last human presence on the Ark, and that it needs his help, and, if he surrenders himself, it will save him. Broadside 1 accepts. So, if you've read the 11th Hour Reports, a series of reports released prior to Halo 4, and read Halo Primordium, some bells should be going off in your head. The UNSC Rubicon was a ship sent to track down a mysterious signal emanating from the Ark. What it found was the heavily damaged armature of 343 Guilty Spark. Of course, it would appear that repeated laser blasts to the face unlocked Spark's memories of his time as the human Chaikus. This is the fictional framework for Primordium. At the end of the book, Spark knocks out the Rubicon's crew and departs for destinations unknown as he pursues the Life Shaper. Interestingly, while this all presumably took place in 2554, based on the context given in the book, the ship wasn't declared MIA until 2557. I'd be interested to hear the story behind that. Moving forward, we jump to March of 2555 on Installation 07, Zeta Halo. Side note, anyone else notice how popular March is in Halo, especially as of late? Halo 3's final scene took place in March of 2553, much of Kilo 5 takes place around the same time, March was the month that Escalation started in, and Master Chief was born in March. Kinda weird. Anyway, on Zeta Halo, we're introduced to our main character, Luther Mann, a doctor of Xenoarchaeology and a linguist. At the age of four, Luther had to watch his homeworld Verdant, interestingly the same homeworld of Spartan Linda 058, glassed by the Covenant. While most looked on in horror, the young Luther couldn't help but call it pretty. While this resulted in a bit of an estranged relationship with his parents, it also led to a lifelong fascination with the Covenant. Post-war, Luther took advantage of the newfound peace to study the Covenant and Forerunners, leading to a station on the Shield world now known as Trevelyan, formerly Onyx, and his discovery of Zeta Halo's location. We then meet Henry Lamb, an engineer and close friend of Luther. As we learn, Luther, Henry, and the Zeta Halo team have been working for weeks to find Halo's control room and activation index, a feat proving incredibly difficult, as it would appear that this Halo was designed differently from the others. Again, if you've read Halo Primordium, you know that this is indeed the truth. As Luther and Henry begin their search for the control room this day, we get a pretty good description of Zeta Halo, and it presents some canonical problems. Much of what Luther describes sounds more like Installation 04 or 05, whereas the depiction of Installation 07 in Halo 3 was more akin to a planet like Venus, with heavy cloud cover. This was reaffirmed in Halo Primordium by UNSC scientists. Of course, we now know that this took place before this story, so what's depicted in Halo 3 and Primordium could be based on outdated information. It is entirely possible that Zeta Halo largely recovered, as Luther also describes local wildlife. Of course, there's another problem. A post by Catalog from a while back, which stated that the flood presence that was time-locked on Zeta Halo's surface was still present when it was discovered, and that it had been burned away by the Sunheli. While I'm still convinced the Catalog meant Installation 05, the fact remains that current fiction seems to have some timeline issues. So anyway, Luther and Henry are about done examining a site when they noticed a small blinking light that seems to indicate a countdown, one that would likely end with the activation of the Halo Array. We jump to a meeting with the UNSC Security Council, along with a few civilian scientists, including one Dr. William Iqbal, who some might recognize from a short story in Halo Evolutions, one that focused on, among other things, reactivating the portal at Voy. After contacting the research stations near Installation 03 and 05, and corroborating data recovered during the Battle of Installation 05, it is confirmed that the Halos are indeed counting down to fire, and they have five weeks. After much deliberation, it is decided that the Songheili will be brought in, despite protests from Saren Osman, 
and that reactivating the portal at Voi is the only way to get to the Ark, where the activation sequence can be stopped. We jump over to Songhelios, where a familiar Songheli is taking out one of those that oppose the Arbiter and his peace with humanity. This is Uze Taham, best known as the fourth co-op character in Halo 3. He returns to Vodum Keep, hoping for some downtime, only to find that Thel has another task. Uze is to travel to Earth and help solve the crisis of the imminent firing of the Halo Array. Of course, he won't go alone. He'll be accompanied by a Hurgog named Drifts Randomly, and another Halo 3 co-op character, Unthos Traum. We jump back to Earth where we're introduced to Captain Annabelle Richards, the woman personally appointed to oversee the Ark mission by Sink Oni Siren Osman. She is accompanied by Spartan Frank Kodiak as they greet Untho, Uze, and Drifts. After some brief introductions, during which it's noted that Drifts once worked with the key ship that was used to activate the portal, Kodiak escorts the Songhelian Hurgok to the location where Luther Mann and Henry Lam are, now overseeing the portal reactivation project. Sometime after, we're introduced to Spartan Elias Holt. It's noted earlier in the book that Spartan Kodiak sported an artificial arm. Through Holt, we learn that the Sangheili who cut it off was none other than Unthros Traum. Needless to say, Richard is just about shits her pants and runs after the group, fearing the worst. Elsewhere, we find ourselves with Luther and Henry, and we get our first look at Olympia Vale. We don't learn much at this point, only that she's a skilled linguist. Kodiak, Untho, Uze, and Drift soon arrive, and introductions are made with Vale's help. When Drifts is introduced, we learn that Luther and Henry both worked with Hurragok before, likely referencing the Hurragok recovered from Trevelyan. Further, Luther actually picked up on some of the Hurragok language, and is capable of communicating with Drifts without a translation device, much to the astonishment of the Sangheili. After some further introductions and diplomacy, Drifts gets to work to reactivate the portal. At this time, Captain Richards shows up, running like a madwoman, and awkwardly asks if everything is alright. Though Kodiak has been given Untho's strange looks from the moment they met, this goes unreported. Richards, wanting to avoid any further awkwardness, calmly requests that Kodiak reports to her at his convenience, which he does not long after she leaves. Meanwhile, we get a bit of insight into Vale's background. Over the course of talking with Uze, in Sangheili, by the way, Vale reveals that she taught herself Sangheili by listening to Covenant recordings. Following the war, she spent several months on the Sangheili colony of Kale Mothka, a colony deeply embroiled in the Sangheili civil war, much to Uze's astonishment. This landed her a position as an Oni diplomat to the Sangheili. Soon after, Uze gives his backstory. In short, he was the son of a swordsman in the keep of Sumai. Uze's father, Toha Sumai, was regarded as one of the best Sangheili swordsmen and trained Uze in combat, though Uze would never know this was his father. Uze would then go on to graduate with honors from one of the top war colleges on Sanghelios. During his time with the Covenant, Uze was offered, and declined, twice to join the Honor Guard. This led to countless punitive actions over the years, and at least two attempted assassinations, all of which Uze was obviously able to avoid. Needless to say, these conversations forged the start of a strong relationship between Vale and the Sanghili. Meanwhile, Kodiak meets up with Captain Richards, whom is rightly pissed with the Spartan. She berates him for not informing her of his connection to Untho. Kodiak points out, however, prior to their first meeting, he had no way of knowing that Untho would be the Sangheili present, and that Kodiak has kept calm thus far. Richards lets the issue go for a moment, but sternly tells Kodiak to keep on his best behavior. We jump forward a couple of days with no noticeable progress on activating the portal. Untho is practicing his swordsmanship near the site when Kodiak, this time in full armor, approaches him with an energy sword of his own. After a brief exchange, the two start sparring, but it quickly becomes clear to Untho that Kodiak isn't doing this for practice. Over the course of the battle, Kodiak reveals that Untho was the one who took his arm. The battle continues to escalate when a shockwave rocks the region. Drifts randomly had activated the portal. The shockwave knocks over a tree which pins Untho to the ground. Though Kodiak has him dead to rights, he instead frees Untho and they go meet up with their comrades. With the portal open, it seems it's time to gather everyone up and head through. Before anyone can do anything, however, a Retriever Sentinel comes through and starts doing what it was made to do, gather resources. It's quickly taken out by the UNSC Endeavor, thankfully. In light of this new development, Untho, Use, Drifts, Richards, Kodiak, Holt, Vale, Luther, Henry, and a handful of Marines meet on board Mayhem, Untho's ship, to discuss what to do next. Interestingly, and I mean no offense to Peter David, Mayhem is probably one of the most mundane names for a Covenant ship in the history of the franchise. I'm not alone in that, right? Anyway, on board Mayhem, Richards reports that she called Osman, requesting additional ships, and wants to wait to hear back. Untho and the Sangheili, on the other hand, feel that no time can be wasted. The portal is open, and there isn't much time to deactivate the rings, especially when you figure in the three-and-a-half-week travel time. 
The debate goes on for a while, but eventually Untho just decides to kidnap his UNSC allies and head straight through. Just as they are about to head through though, another Retriever Sentinel appears, this one more heavily armed. Mayhem is able to take it out with relative ease and heads through. Once in slipspace, it's soon discovered that something at the Ark is tampering with the portal. Instead of weeks, the trip will only take a few hours. While a blessing at first, what awaits on the other side proves to be anything but. Once through the portal, Mayhem is attacked by a slew of Retriever Sentinels, all of them clearly armed for serious combat. Though it does manage to take them all out, Mayhem incurs heavy damage and crash lands on the Ark. While Mayhem generally holds together, much of the recon and attack vehicles on board, including a Condor brought by Captain Richards, are severely damaged. Thankfully though, the weapons prove more resilient. Finding themselves about 30 kilometers from the Citadel, Untho and Richards decide to continue the mission. Untho, Uze, Drifts, Vale, Kodiak, Holt, Luther, Henry, Richards, and her Marines head out to finish the mission they started. Accompanying them are the Sanghili Kola Bauth and Zone Vadum. And I gotta say, it's nice to see another Sanghili from the line of Vadum. Given that we have a book dedicated to the Shadow of Intent later this year, I kind of hope we get to see Zone again. He doesn't do much in this book, but it's always nice to have Sanghili from the same lineage interacting. With the rest of the Sanghili crew staying behind to do what they can to repair the mayhem, the main group sets out to stop the Halo Array. The location they landed in is noted as being pretty damn cold, making for a slow journey, especially with the unaugmented personnel that are tagging along. At first, things seem to be going well, until a creature appears in the distance. This is a blind wolf, though they won't be named until sometime later. The group is initially able to go quiet and allow the blind wolves to pass them by, but another group of creatures, described as polar bear-like with tusks, shows up. They have eyes, they see the group, and the group opens fire. This naturally attracts the attention of the blind wolves, and all hell breaks loose. Though they ultimately win, the group doesn't exactly come out unscathed. Three marines are killed, and Olympia Vale is nowhere to be found. Though the group doesn't know it, Vale found herself face to face with one of the polar bear creatures. But instead of attacking, she felt a strange calm, and a voice in her head called out to her. She then started walking away with the creature for reasons she couldn't quite understand. It just felt right. So, with Vale MIA, the group decides to split up. Henry, Uze, and Holt are tasked with finding Vale, while the rest continue their mission at hand. Of course, not moments after splitting up, Richards takes a wrong step into a concealed crater, her knee snapping. Richards is out of the picture, and after some protest, she is escorted back to Mayhem by her marines. Luther, Kodiak, Drifts, Untho, Zone, and Kola continue forward. It's not long before they come across another creature, this one thankfully pretty docile. Described as rabbit-like with wings, Luther finds he's actually able to approach and pet the creature before it flies away. Not long after that, it returns, followed by what's described as a giant Whiteford mammoth creature. Though initially expecting more hostility, it turns out that this creature is offering to act as a mount, lifting the group onto its back before heading towards the Citadel. If you haven't figured it out yet, this, Vale's disappearance, and whatever saved Broadside 1 at the start, is all the work of the Ark's monitor. Meanwhile, the group searching for Vale isn't exactly having the best time. The snow and wind make it difficult to track Vale's path. Interestingly though, it seems that she had already been heading towards the Foundry and Citadel, the same destination the group would ultimately have to head to. When Vale's path is eventually obscured, they have little choice but to continue towards their ultimate destination. As they venture forth, the area starts to warm, once again revealing Vale's path. Incidentally, they also find themselves near the remains of High Charity. And just as things are looking up, a group of Forerunner Constructs suddenly appears. It wouldn't be said until later, but these are Armigers, Forerunner Constructs related to the soldiers that we'll be encountering in Halo 5. The Armigers attack, though throughout the whole encounter, they don't seem to be trying to kill the group. At least not directly. Several times, the Armigers have the opportunity to end the group with their weapons, which incidentally are described as light rifles, but instead do something weird like throw a tree or start an avalanche. The group ultimately survives their encounter, but have once again lost Vale's trail, and worse, cannot make contact with the other group. 